the Australian shores first experienced war on the last day of May 1942. Until then, the global conflict had been just a distant rumor. But when the Japanese Imperial Navy attacked Sydney Harbor and surprised everyone, yet another continent had been pulled into the chaos. An uneasy atmosphere could be felt in the port shortly before midnight, and the sailors in the docked vessels were restless. Some claimed that there was a Japanese submarine in the harbor, but others dismissed the idea. Even Rear Admiral Gerard Muirhead Gold of the Royal Navy, in charge of the port that night, sarcastically said, quote, If you see another sub, see if the captain has a black beard. I'd like to meet him. Then, a ship exploded. Surprise attack. On May 29, 1942, five massive Imperial Japanese Navy first-class submarines from the 8th Submarine Squadron rendezvoused about 35 nautical miles northeast of Sydney Harbor. They were led by Captain Hankyu Sasaki. A couple of weeks earlier, the submarines had been ordered to proceed to the Japanese naval base at Truk Lagoon in the Caroline Islands to receive some precious cargo that would be useful in their next mission. Before the break of daylight the following morning, the squadron executed aerial reconnaissance sorties, carefully assessing their targets. I-21 and I-29 each carried a Yokosuka E-14Y1 Glen floatplane and looked at several Australasian harbors to detect the most vulnerable ones. While I-21 surveyed Noumea, Suva, and Auckland, I-29 went to Sydney. Her floatplane then flew a daring reconnaissance mission over the port, circling the cruiser USS Chicago twice, and then returning to the east. The bold aerial intrusion was observed and reported by the enemy, but no special defensive measures were implemented. At the time, the defenses at Sydney Harbor consisted of eight anti-submarine indicator loops and a partially constructed boom net with wide gaps of 400 meters at each side. Material shortages had prevented its completion, so the poorly constructed barrier remained the only defense for the peaceful ships resting at the port. In fact, many witnesses believe that it must have been an American floatplane conducting routine training. But for the Japanese, it was the latest of a series of reconnaissance flights that provided invaluable intelligence for a surprise attack on the port. Among the multiple Allied ships that stood out as prime targets were HMAS Canberra and USS Chicago. On May 31st, the motherships I-27, I-22, and I-24 spread in an arc formation 13 kilometers from the harbor entrance and began what would be known as the Battle of Sydney. The vessels then released their secret weapons, a squadron of midget submarines. Type A Kohiyoteki The Imperial Japanese Navy built 50 A-target submarines, named to provide a cover story in case a foe prematurely discovered the design. In that case, the Japanese could argue that the tiny ships were mere practice targets. In reality, however, the submarines were true naval weapons, and one of them, number 19, was even deployed at Pearl Harbor from I-24. The submarines measured 23.9 meters long, 3 meters high, and had a beam of 1.8 meters. When submerged, their displacement was 46 long tons. A single electric motor of 600 horsepower powered two counter-rotating screws on a single shaft, while the leading propeller was 1.35 meters in diameter and its trailing counterpart was 1.25 meters wide. The small submarines were able to reach 23 knots when surfaced and 19 knots when submerged. Their range was merely 18 nautical miles at maximum speed, but they could cover 100 nautical miles when traveling at two knots. Each midget ship was armed with two 450mm torpedoes mounted in stacked muzzle-loading tubes at the bow. Besides, the submarines were equipped with a demolition charge, which weaponized them and was strong enough to blow up the entire vessel. However, there's no evidence the submarines were ever used as suicide weapons. In terms of complement, the miniature ships had a crew of two, a junior and a petty officer. The first conned the boat, while the latter manipulated valves and controlled trim and diving. In addition, the vessels had hull numbers, but were given no names and were identified by their mothership's number. 
Most of the midget submarine fleet was unaccounted for, but one operation at Sydney Harbor in the summer of 1942 did make it into the annals of history. Low Guard On the day of the attack, six of the defense's indicator loops were inactive. Moreover, the North Head-South Head indicator loop was known to give faulty signals, and with civilian traffic often passing over, guards usually dismissed the readings. Still, May 31st was no drill. M27 was the first midget submarine to enter the harbor at approximately 8 p.m. She had barely entered the area when her propellers became entangled in the Western Boomgate anti-submarine net. Soon, the disturbance in the water's surface drew unwanted attention, and the snared vessel was spotted and reported. Meanwhile, the second submarine, M24, successfully trespassed into the harbor shortly before 10 p.m., but USS Chicago quickly identified the ship's periscope less than 500 meters from the cruiser. Alert sailors on the deck turned a searchlight on the area and opened fire, but their guns couldn't be sufficiently depressed, and the gunfire had no discernible effect. The submarine appeared to have escaped. Subsequently, the patrol boats HMAS Euroma and HMAS Lolita approached to investigate the object trapped in the net. But the proud Japanese sailors would give it their all before being captured, and as they realized they wouldn't free their ship in time, they fired demolition charges, destroyed the submarine, and perished in the explosion. At 10.37 p.m., a general alarm was finally raised. Chaos ensued, as visibility was limited, and ferries continued to hunt the submarines down. Then, at 11.14 p.m., the officer in charge of the harbor, Royal Navy Rear Admiral Gerard Muirhead Gould, ordered all ships to observe blackout conditions. Still, floodlights remained on until 12.25 a.m. Skeptical about an attack from enemy submarines, Muirhead Gould sat on a barge towards the boom net to inspect the trapped object personally. The Admiral then reportedly expressed, quote, What are you all playing at? Running up and down the harbor, dropping depth charges, and talking about enemy subs in the harbor. There's not one to be seen. Then, at about 12.30 a.m., the naval depot ship HMAS Cuttable suddenly exploded. Response It was later found that the crew of the M24 submarine had aimed at USS Chicago, but the torpedoes missed and struck the converted harbor ferry moored at Garden Island instead. The mistake sealed the fate of 19 Australian and two British sailors. Meanwhile, brave bandsman M. N. Cumming and ordinary seaman L. T. Combers plunged into the biting southern waters and swam between shattered glass and jagged woodwork, frantically looking for survivors. M-24 had also fired a second torpedo, but ran aground on rocks to the east of Garden Island and failed to explode. Having run out of ammunition, the midget submarine turned to the harbor entrance and disappeared, apparently running out of fuel before reaching her destination. The harbor was alive with activity following the attack on Chicago, but many people believed the gunfire was part of a naval exercise. Still, the real attack continued into the early hours of June 1st, as a third miniature submarine, M-22, approached the harbor and Allied ships proceeded to sea. The last of the three envoys did not make it far, as she was almost immediately spotted in Taylor's Bay. Patrol boats Sea Mist, Steady Hour, and Euroma repeatedly bombed her with depth charges. The following day, a clearance diving team was sent to investigate the wreck. Despite the damage, the engines were still, and the propellers turned slowly. Not long after, they raised the tiny crippled vessel and discovered that her crew had honorably self-inflicted fatal gunshot wounds. After it became evident that their midget submarines were not coming back, the defeated Japanese motherships departed. Aftermath Before the audacious attack, Sydney siders regarded the war as a somewhat distant conflict, but the Japanese midget submarines made sure to bring the war to their shores. Several days were needed to recover from the blow, including accounting for the 21 ratings lost in Cuttable. Then, on June 3rd, 
Muirhead Gould and 200 Navy personnel attended a burial service with naval honors. Remarkably, the four Japanese submariners were also recognized for their bravery and received naval honors at Rookwood Cemetery. A diplomatic exchange arranged for the cremated remains to be returned to the families in Japan two months after the assault, which the Japanese fondly appreciated. Still, the only submarine that escaped, M24, is believed to have attacked many Allied merchant ships the week following the engagement. Moreover, she is said to be responsible for shelling Sydney Harbor. The fate of the midget submarine was discovered in late 2006, when seven scuba divers returned to a spot they had marked months prior and were excited to check out what their fish finder had spotted on the seafloor. As the group visited the site, they found a large object covered in a fishing net. Propellers stuck out of the sand on one end, and the group then found the conning tower. Finally, four torpedo tubes at the front confirmed their theories. The divers eventually met with the director of the Naval Heritage Collection, Commander Shane Moore, who confirmed the finding of the missing midget submarine. Nevertheless, the wreck's exact location remains concealed to protect it from scavengers. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up and share it with someone who might like it. Also, let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more history-inspired stories. Stay tuned.